Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the 25th meeting of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee for 2017. Uh, can I ask everybody to turn phones to silent mode? And for our guests, uh, there's no need to press your button for the microphone. Uh, the audio tech guys will come to you directly. Um, I have a few announcements to make before we get into the substance of today's meeting. Firstly, I have apologies from our convener, Christina McKelvey, MSP, who will not be able to attend uh, this meeting or meetings for the next few weeks due to health reasons. As deputy convener, I'll be chairing meetings in her absence, and I'm sure I speak for the whole committee and the staff when I wish her a speedy recovery. Secondly, I'd like to welcome Linda Fabiani, MSP, here today as a substitute member for the committee. Before I move into our first item of business, I'd like to take a few moments to acknowledge the very sad passing of Ian Methven, one of our official reporters who supports our committee. Along with his colleague Simon Eelbeck, Ian attended our committee each week to transcribe our proceedings. Ian was one of the longest serving members of the official report, joining the Scottish Parliament with the original group of staff back in 1998. In fact, during one of the first, very first committee meetings of the Parliament back in June of 99, the then convener decided to introduce all of the support staff by reading their names into the record. Turning to the official report staff, there was some debate as to whether reporters should remain anonymous. One committee member playfully remarked that official report staff don't have time to have names, they just write. The convener did read the names of both official report staff that present that day into the record, and one of them was Ian. All of us know that Ian and his colleagues in the official report do so, so much more than just write. Like his colleagues, Ian dedicated his career to making the Scottish Parliament a success. He worked daily to deliver the founding principles of this Parliament to be open, accessible and accountable to the people of Scotland through his high quality reporting work. That work has earned Ian and his official report colleagues the respect of us all in this place. I know it will be very difficult for Ian's colleagues to transcribe these words into the official report, um, into the very official report that Ian worked so hard to produce. However, just as our predecessors did 17 years ago, I think it is fitting that we acknowledge Ian's quiet and steadfast contribution to the work of the Scottish Parliament by reading his name into the record again here today. So on behalf of the convener, uh, Christina McKelvey, and all of the members and staff of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee, can I offer our sincere condolences to Ian's wife, Elizabeth, and his family, and to his professional family and friends in both the official report and across this parliament who are grieving now at his untimely loss. I should add that Simon Neilbeck of the official report has asked that we record the thanks of, uh, to the committee of the official report for this tribute. Okay, so thank you for that. Um, we move now uh, to our first item of business today, which is to begin our scrutiny of the Scottish Government's draft budget for 2018-19. And today we look back uh, to the recommendations we made in our report on last year's draft budget on disabled students and BSL users applying to and studying at Scottish universities. The aim of today's session is to assess progress being made in implementing that report. The evidence session today will therefore have BSL interpretation. I, I thank them and I welcome them to the meeting, provided for people both in the public gallery and watching online. And to that end, I would ask both uh, committee members and uh, the panels that we have before us today to consider that when answering and, and try to speak slowly where possible. So can I uh, welcome first to the committee, Professor Sir Peter Scott, the Commissioner for Fair Access to Higher Education in Scotland. Welcome, Commissioner. Uh, Dr. Kemp, Interim Chief Executive, and Fiona Burns, who is Assistant Director as Access and Outcome Agreement Manager, both of the Scottish Funding Council. Welcome very much to you both. Can I remind the panel that they do not need to switch on the microphones? Uh, that will be done <coughs> for them. And, and I'd like just to start with a quite generous open uh, question. First to uh, uh, the Commissioner. Um, you've been in post 10 months now. Perhaps you could... Uh, Tell us how you've spent that time. Um, well, I've spent that time uh, on three main things, I think. Um, first of all, familiarising myself with uh, Scottish education. Um, 
Uh, I was always fairly familiar with the universities, uh, a bit less so with the colleges, um, uh, and less so again in relation to schools. So um, I've taken every opportunity to visit institutions, um, accept invitations when I've been given them to come and give talks uh, and to meet people generally. Uh, and uh, everyone has been very generous with their time and that's been very helpful to me. Um, the second thing I've done uh, is that I decided um, uh, that it would be a mistake simply to concentrate uh, all my efforts on producing one annual report, sort of one shot a year, so to speak, um, uh, and that it was important to try and maintain a kind of debate about issues of fair access. So on the Commissioner uh, website, uh, we've published a number of discussion documents um, on key themes, um, uh, two so far, a third one is about to come out, and two more are in preparation. Um, and the idea of these discussion documents is that they present all the data, all the evidence, um, in as accessible a form, because uh, I would like them to be read very widely, um, uh, also as objectively as possible, um, because I realize sometimes they raise issues on which there are different opinions. Um, and separate from the, uh, uh, the data and evidence, um, I've included commentary by myself, um, which inevitably expresses views to a greater extent, um, uh, but people can separate that quite clearly from the, the data and the evidence, um, uh, and they can take my views or leave it depending on what they think. Um, so that's the second thing I've been doing. Um, a third thing I've doing, been doing, of course, is preparing my first annual report, um, uh, which is uh, due at the end of the year. Um, as it's my first report, um, I decided it should be relatively comprehensive and cover all the key issues, many of which should be familiar to members of this committee, um, uh, but also some of the big um, uh, uh, controversial issues. Um, uh, um, uh, I don't think I should shy away from those. I think they should be openly debated uh, in a democratic society. Um, uh, as it's the first time there hasn't been a commissioner before and there's been no annual report, um, uh, I'm starting literally with a blank sheet of paper. Um, so that's been quite a challenge. Um, so those are the three major things I've been spending my time on. Um, I think I would emphasize the first, really, uh, visiting institutions uh, and uh, getting to know people uh, in, in the sector. Thank you, Commissioner. I'm sure that myself and my colleagues will come back to you with specific questions about your work and your remit. And then if I can turn to the Funding Council, thanks again for coming. And uh, particularly thank you for your report. It was clear that you uh, found a synergy with the views of this committee in the work that we've done around widening access uh, to, to our universities, particularly around BSL and the wider disabled community. Um, and you seem quite uh, open to the recommendations. Can you perhaps give us a flavour of how you intend to take that work forward? forward um, following this session and indeed the, the wider work of the committee? First of all, can I say I'm, I'm glad that you see that there is a synergy between you know, your recommendations and you know, what we, th we saw as important for um, particularly universities to be delivering. And, and that's very much, as you can see, it's fed into our, our guidance for outcome agreements. The way that we intend to take that forward is, through, is primarily through um, in intensification of the outcome agreements. Um, we, we were here, um, I think, in December last year, and your report came out in the early part of, the, of, of this year. Um, we have only just put out the guidance for the next set of outcome agreements. But in that, the time between your report um, and that guidance going out, we have been working quite closely on how we intensify the outcome agreement process, which is, has been something that is relatively recently introduced um, and has been on a, you know, a, a trajectory of improvement. And we've been keen to, to intensify that improvement and make sure that you know, increasingly it's delivering the outcomes you know, as, as, as fast as, as possible. So we, we've been seeing this work as you know, very much something that we, we feed into that process so that we're being very clear um, with universities about you know, what it is that we all um, you know, see as important they deliver and you know, we will use the process to do that. Fiona, is there anything you'd like to add? I don't, I don't really think I've got anything more to add to, add to that. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Great stuff. Well, I'd like to open it up to my colleagues on the committee, starting with Gail Ross. Thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. Um, Professor Scott, I'd like to um, get a little bit more insight into your role, if you don't mind. Um, can I ask you where you're based? 
Uh, well, I'm, uh, I obviously, I'm, I'm not based in Scotland. I have another job, a day job in, in London. Um, uh, and I devote uh, uh, three to five days a month um, uh, officially to this role. Um, in practice, I've devoted a lot more time than that. Um, uh, when I'm based, uh, I come either here to Edinburgh or to Glasgow. Um, I probably go to Glasgow more often than Edinburgh, unless it's uh, for an occasion like this. And in your um, three to five days, which I have no doubt that you do spend a lot more time than that on it, um, in respect of the widening access, what would you say um, you've been concentrating on so far? Well, inevitably, I think I've been concentrating on uh, the uh, targets which were recommended by the Commission on Widening Access and accepted by the government. Um, in particular, the 20% target that 20% uh, of... Uh, students in 2030 in higher education should come from the 20% most deprived areas in Scotland, um, which is a very bold ambition. And of course, the interim targets and the specific institutional targets. Um, but I've always been very mindful uh, that disadvantage comes in many forms. Um, and as I say in my written statement, um, I've always been very personally committed to the needs of uh, adult students and part-time students um, uh, and uh, I think also disabled students are, are another important group who also suffer disadvantage. Um, so I think it's important while focusing on the targets, the formal targets that have been set, um, that we should always pay attention to the wider range of disadvantage and see it as a kind of a, 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 kind of a whole set of uh, inevitably, because sometimes people um, will suffer multiple forms of disadvantage. I mean, uh, for example, many uh, disabled young people, uh, because they've been disabled and because their needs have not been adequately met at earlier stages in the education system, uh, will, um, when they come to entry to higher education, have other forms of, uh, of, 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 uh, of deficit which need to be addressed. So disadvantage comes in many forms. Um, but as I said, initially, my focus has had to, I think, be on the, uh, the, the, the targets. Do you think that three to five days a month is enough? Because it's a huge remit. Well, I think it depends very much on, on how the role is seen. Um, uh, uh, the role at the moment, um, inevitably, is one where uh, I stand as uh, a bit outside the system. Um, uh, I'm an observer of it, a commentator, a critical friend, uh, all those things. Um, uh, I don't have any executive functions. I don't have any regulatory functions. Um, uh, I think that's uh, probably a good model. Um, but nevertheless, I'm aware of the demands of my time. Uh, and uh, um, I think I have to accept that because I'm the first commissioner, this is in a sense is work in progress. Um, uh, I'm sure after, uh, I've now been reappointed for another year, so after two years, I think uh, that would be probably the time for me to make any more definitive statement about um, whether this role works as it's co currently constructed or whether it needs to be changed. Okay. Um, you, you touched a little bit on your annual report that's due out at the end of this year. Can you give us um, any indication of what inclusion of disabled and BSL users will be in that report? Well, I mean, I have to admit that uh, they won't be covered in any detail, although uh, there is a section, or there will be a section in my annual report, that looks at uh, other forms of disadvantage, um, uh, as opposed to those that are measured by the index of multiple deprivation. Um, uh, uh, so, in my annual report, there will be certainly mentions of disabled students, but uh, I don't think at this stage they will go into detail, not as much detail as your report inevitably did. Um, having said that, um, I mentioned earlier the publication of discussion documents, and one of the future discussion documents we plan is to look at the other forms of disadvantage, um, age, uh, gender, um, uh, disability would certainly be one of them, ethnicity might be another, um, to try and focus attention on those other forms of disability as well and try and build a broader kind of agenda for the future. Okay, um, and just one last convener, if I may. Um, 
How do you anticipate supporting the Scottish Funding Council and um, other partners around fair access for disabled and BSL users? Um, well, I suppose I envisage them supporting me to <laughs> the other way around, probably. Um, and uh, John and his colleagues have been very generous in their offers, uh, so that we, if there are areas that I need further investigation or we need uh, better research evidence, that they are certainly prepared to help me uh, provide that evidence. Um, so I think we have established a good working relationship, uh, and I'm very happy about that. Um, um, inevitably, I think um, my role gives me, uh, because I have a degree of independence, um, perhaps I have a, a right to be uh, a bit more forthright than the Funding Council uh, itself can be. Um, I'm not sure whether that will be welcomed by John and his colleagues or not, um, but I certainly think that's part of my role, um, uh, perhaps to push the boundaries of debate a little bit further. Can I, can I say, I mean, that is very much mutual support. I mean, that, that we, we value the, the advice that we, we get from Peter. That we, our Access and Inclusion Committee has engaged with Peter. Peter spoke at our Access Conference earlier in the year. And, and, but often the, there is a role about challenging us, which um, you know, part of what Peter's annual report should be doing, um, it should be challenging the government, the SFC and the institutions about where they are in delivering on the priorities. But there's also, a, I, I think, what I find a very valuable support role that you know, Peter's very experienced in this area. Um, and bouncing ideas off Peter and having you know, Peter help join up um, bits of the system and see things from slightly afar is sometimes a useful role because we're often you know very much in the middle of um, you know discussions with universities about where they are on detailed issues sometimes having the, the, the slightly more helicopter view that Peter can bring from looking from outside and saying that's good enough or not good enough um, can, can help quite a bit okay Thank you for that. Um, if I may add by supplemental to Gail Ross's line of questioning. Firstly, um, Commissioner, it, it is great to have you in post. I mean, uh, there was a number of times during the inquiry that you were referenced or your position was referenced by people who said, well, hopefully this will be sorted by the Commissioner for fairer access. I, I think if I could suggest that I, I do have a concern from your report that you've rightly been focused on uh, getting uh, students from SIMD areas into higher education but you recognise that this is a, 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 new, a new seam that you need to tap into in terms of BSL and disabled users. Um, can I ask on behalf of the committee that you uh, reflect as you go forward on whether your time is sufficient for that, to that end and, and, and come back to us in, if you need more time, if we can lobby for more time being devoted to your work on that? Because I think it, it is a big area. We, we're surprised at just how big it, it was and, and we'd like to take that forward. Final supplementary, if I may. Um, we heard testimony from witnesses in the inquiry who pointed to other institutions where they uh, are perhaps getting access right. And uh, the University of Lancashire uh, was a good example of uh, seen as a centre of excellence for BSL users. Um, to what extent is your role about disseminating best practice both within in, between institutions in the British Isles, but also um, from further afield in terms of identifying best practice internationally? Well, I think it's certainly important that I should take a very broad view. Um, uh, just yesterday, a very interesting report on models of support for students with disabilities was actually published, um, which had been commissioned by the English Higher Education Funding Council. Uh, carried out by the, the Institute of Employment Studies. And that's really quite a detailed report, and there are very interesting things in that, um, uh, covering um, the governance arrangements and budgetary arrangements for supporting uh, disabled students, the actual organization the support services themselves, uh, developing the idea of inclusive provision so that disabled students are not excluded in any way, uh, and inevitably uh, monitoring and evaluation of those initiatives. Um, uh, so uh, that's uh, I've read that with a lot of interest. Um, uh, I, uh, um, I think probably more broadly in Europe, uh, although I'm less familiar with uh, official documents there. I think that would be good. Um, after all, this is a very, uh, an issue we all have in common. Um, uh, I think there's always been a risk that disability is seen as a problem for the students themselves. They have disabilities. Um, the problem, I think, really needs to be turned the other way around. So the problem is our perception of them and our, our ability to actually um, 
accommodate the needs they have. Um, and I think it's very important that institutions see it in that proactive way. I think, as you said, many institutions do already, and, and, and there's, there's plenty of good practice, I think, to draw on here. Thank you. I believe Mary Fee has a direct supplementary question on this. Uh, thank you. It, it was about um, access to universities through the application process, and I'm grateful that the convener has let me in. Um, we heard when we were taking evidence that there is a very standardised form of application process, and some students with disabilities have difficulty um, going through that process because it is in, in, in one format. One university um, said to us that they would um, take applications in alternative forums where it was considered an appropriate adjustment. And the use of that language gives me some con concern. And they've pushed back to say that it should be UCAS who looks at <coughs> different types of application process. And I just wonder, particularly from Prof Professor Scott, is that something that you would be able to look at and make specific recommendations about? Because clearly to open access to um, young people with disabilities, the application process would mm -hmm. seem to be the automatic place to go. Well, I think there are probably two aspects to that. One is, as you say, um, uh, UCAS is a UK-Y body, um, and the procedures it's adopted, in a sense, would have to be negotiated across the whole of the UK. Um, uh, then, of course, there's the way in which individual universities would use those applications and any supplementary material they might, might need. Um, I think the point you make is a very fair one. Uh, I have to say uh, I can't claim any great expertise um, in the actual form of admissions and how user-friendly they are for a disabled student. I know that universities make major efforts to accommodate the needs of, uh, of disabled students when they've actually become students themselves in terms of accommodation, in terms of access to lectures and tutorials and so on. Um, uh, but the point you make is a very important one. I mean, they have to be there in the first place. Um, and if there's an unnecessary barrier created there, that's obviously highly undesirable. Um, I don't think there's any lack of goodwill, um, but when you have a distributed system where some responsibility lies with UCAS, some with the individual university, and within the university between the admissions office and the, the actual way the decisions are taken by individual departments on admitting particular students, um, there is uh, at least scope for some kind of buck passing there, and a kind of, it's not clear whether responsibility, and that's actually one of the major points made in the report I just mentioned to the English Funding Council, that there should be champions, there should be a single source where these things are actually uh, decided within institutions. Mr. Kemp, I don't know, yeah, did you want to comment? I, think, oh, I, I agree with that point that, that Peter just made. There should be a, a single source. I, I would be concerned if too much was done at the individual institution level and there was too much um, you know, different practice in different institutions. Because many students, well, most students applying through UCAS apply to more than one institution. It's a very standardised UK system. And one of the, the challenges we'd found um, in other aspects of the, the application system particularly in contextualised admissions, is if the students don't know how their um, um, application is going to be treated, what special you know, cases will be taken into um, account and so on, they will often not say it and the application might be unsuccessful. And it, if, if, if it's very much down to the institution perhaps taking these things into um, account or not, the student might not necessarily, or the potential student might not know that. So the more it's done through um, the UCAS formal system, the better. Which, the challenge with that though is that that's a, a UK-wide, um, very big, slick system where you know, it's, it's quite hard to tweak. Um, so that makes you know, quick change um, more difficult. But in, in the long run, I think that's probably better for potential students in that you then have your transparency and clarity about the system and, and, and what kinds of things will be taken into account that might not happen if it's done at institutional level. That said, there are special cases at institutional level you'd want to see them react to as well. But I think getting that balance right is important. Okay, thank you. Can I just provide, yeah. um, just for a bit of reassurance in terms of the BSL National Plan um, and the Funding Council, we've been asked to set up a steering group, which we're in the process of doing, and it will be led by um, BSL users, and we'll include BSL users, but my point of um, informing you about that is UCAS are aware of that. We have regular um, updates and meetings with them. They're aware that this is an area of work that's coming up, and they will more than likely be a key member within that group to take forward the very points that, that you raised. Thank you. Thank you, Convener.
Thank you, Mary. I believe Linda Fabiani had a supplemental on this as well. Yes, uh, uh, directly involved with this. Can I say, first of all, uh, as substitute to this committee, I've not been involved in much of the discussion, but there was something, um, Mr Scott, in your submission that jumped out at me when I read it, which was point eight about the committee recommendation of a connection between the institution's commitments and the outcome agreements with the, the Scottish Funding Council which I, I thought was interesting, and you agreed with that, Mr Scott. So I would like <coughs> you know, both sides' view of how that could work, because one of my concerns, I, I can see that, and I can also buy into the fact that we need to change the culture in institutions as well, which is also mentioned. But I, I have a concern um, that I also have across many um, institutional walks of life, which is that when you set something up rigidly, you can very often have all the boxes ticked mm. and you're not actually getting a qualitative analysis of what's happening underneath that. So just a general view on your thinking behind that and how it could work. Well, um, the specific comment I was trying to make in relation to outcome agreements is that um, they, they really serve two purposes. I mean, I think they're really excellent in terms of trying to get agreement between the institution and the funding council, and in a sense, the public interest more broadly about the overall strategic direction the institution's going to take and its priorities. Um, they work really well in that respect. Um, but also they have a second purpose, and that is to monitor particular kind of areas. Um, uh, and this might be one, disability, uh, fair access more generally is another. Um, there will be other ones as well. There'll be a whole range of them. Um, so striking the right balance between the outcome agreement as an effective overall strategic setting document um, and a monitoring document in relation to particular initiatives and programs um, is, is, it struck me, a difficult one to make. Um, uh, I, I think in terms of culture change, though, um, uh, the outcome agreement is a good way in which I think one can um, gain the commitment of the institution at its most senior level to taking issues really seriously and therefore developing a kind of mechanism by which culture change can take place. Um, there is a risk, as you say, that otherwise it becomes a kind of box ticking exercise. Have you assessed this program? Do you have an action plan? You tick them all, um, uh, and it's not always clear what it all adds up to. Um, there was a very interesting uh, article in the Herald recently um, uh, by someone from Clyde College. I'm afraid I should have uh, checked the details before I came to this meeting. Um, but she was making the point that from an institution's point of view, often you, there seem to be lots of different boxes. You have There's, there's dis disability over here that's kind of... Uh, recruiting students from areas of multiple deprivation there, various other bits and pieces. Um, uh, and it's not always clear how they all kind of uh, add up together. Um, now, I know ultimately that's a responsibility for the senior leadership of the institution, the principal, uh, and his or her immediate colleagues. Um, but at the middle level of an institution or the grassroots of an institution, it can appear all very, very separated, uh, I think, in a way. Uh, and it's important to try and work towards a more coherent picture, which was the point I was trying to make about being more proactive. I, 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 outcome agreements are called outcome agreements. And the, what we are keen to see is shifts in the outcomes for students, um, you know, inequalities and other areas as well. So to some extent, um, in the ideal world, we wouldn't need to worry about all the tick box of, you know, making sure they have a policy and that they've done this and that and separate returns and so on. We recognise, though, that we're not in the ideal world, but we need to keep on um, thinking about outcomes rather than seeing success as, you know, an institution that has, you know, a separate beautiful, glossy policy on every single aspect of equalities, and they've ticked all the boxes, and they've done all the awareness raising, they've done this, that, or the other, but the outcomes for students still aren't moving. You know, that wouldn't, that, that wouldn't be success in my book. We need to look at the outcomes. And these, 
things where we do occasionally require, you know, tick boxes and policies and so on in the outcome agreement process, they need to be seen as stepping stones to changing the outcome. And if they're not doing that, they're not doing the right thing. So that's what very much what we've tried to do in the outcome agreement process is, is see equalities as, you know, one big issue where access it isn't just about socio-economic access, you know, it covers gender is a huge issue in, in, in universities and colleges and you know, in a fairly complex way sometimes seeing all these things as one issue and trying to avoid a series of granular separate policies where you know issues of gender are separate from issues of social class, which are separate from disability. In, in the reality, these things all intersect and should be seen as part of the um, the same challenge. Um, and as Peter said, you know there are there have been um, issues about you know the, the the amount of reporting that's required and the amount of separate reports on, on separate groups. And we always need to keep an eye on that to make sure that we're not overburdening institutions. But we also need to make sure that they are um, and seeking to address all of the outcomes for for all the different groups. So it's a difficult balance to strike, but it's one that we, you know, we need to keep on looking at, but keep that focus on the outcomes. I also think thanks to the work of this committee and the latest outcome agreement guidance, we've made a, a, a real strong effort to make sure the public sector equality duties are reminded that, that is, that's really the starting point for any equality initiative or work that you're doing, that there has been a very um, strong and thorough um, mainstreaming process that's gone through at that institution. And then once you've got that, at that point, you then consider your gender action plan, anything else that you are being asked through the Funding Council, Scottish Government, anywhere else, so that it has good um, intersectionality with it and ensures it considers all the protected characteristics and doesn't kind of get focused away with just considering gender on its own, because that's certainly not what we want to achieve. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. And Jamie, did you want to come in on this topic? OK, Jamie Green. Uh, thank you, Convener. It's probably very relevant to the comment uh, Fiona just made. Um, Professor Scott, in your uh, written submission, you use the phrase uh, that you want to highlight the risk that focusing too tightly on the um, index of multiple de deprivation targets may lead to efforts to tackle other forms of disadvantage uh, being downgraded. In the future, I hope to be able to broaden out my work to cover all forms of disadvantage. Could, this might be a good time to expand on what those other forms of disadvantage might be and indeed uh, how you think we could combat that risk of those being lost and the narrow focus on the, the index of deprivation. Well, I don't want to uh, be misunderstood. Um, I may have uh, um, exaggerated. I mean, I think uh, SIMD is a very good index of multiple deprivation. Uh, it's certainly superior to the equivalent um, one across that's used in England, although it's available across the UK. Uh, the polar system, um, uh, it's much more fine grain. Um, uh, the, what I have really had in mind is that the focus is very much on young entrants. Um, uh, if an institution has to meet its targets, it's focusing all its efforts on meeting a particular target, inevitably it will prioritise recruitment of certain groups of students and, by definition, pay less attention to other students. Um, I'm very aware, for example, there are many people who uh, uh, seek to enter higher education, say, in their mid-20s. Um, uh, uh, they may have caught up a bit on any deficits they had in, in school education. Uh, they may have been remotivated for a whole number of reasons. Um, the risk is under the current uh, targets, they don't really count. Um, uh, so that's one group. Um, uh, I'm very concerned about the uh, needs of part-time study. Um, to some degree, I think the definition we currently have between who's a full-time student and who's a part-time student is a pretty artificial one. Um, and increasingly, I think students want to study in more flexible ways. Um, but again, there's a risk we've imposed a kind of rather rigid template here. Uh, and if you fall outside that, um, again, uh, you don't count to meeting a target, um, uh, and although targets are very important um, in terms of measuring progress and particularly measuring comparative performance between institutions, uh, nevertheless, there's, there are always unintended consequences of targets. Um, uh, so those were the kind of issues I had in mind. Um, 
And of course, uh, disability um, would be another group that's currently not covered by those targets. Um, although uh, care experienced students are included in that target. Um, so I'm simply saying that although one will always have to define the areas one's focusing on in the short run, you should always keep that under review because there may be other groups that actually their needs become more prominent and they, they, they should be reflected more fairly. Those are the kind of ideas I had. Thank you. If I may, we'll move on to another line of questioning now, and I'd like to bring in Annie Wells, who'd take us there. Been our, and good morning, panel. Um, the route I want to get down is sort of the mental health route, because we know that students who disclose mental health issues have the lowest outcomes when it comes to it. So really what I want to, to sort of find out, there's two, two sides to it. What is being done to create parity between the support provided for those with mental health um, issues and those with physical disabilities? And how does this extend into staff training? And I'll just put the next question there. And it's what is being done to encourage those that haven't disclosed mental health issues to come forward and get the support they need at university or college? Uh, there's quite a lot of questions in there. Yeah. I, 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 the re, I think the reason we're being a bit hesitant is that some of those um, about staff training and so on are probably better addressed to the, the universities themselves. Um, and w what we've been trying to do is focus on the, the outcomes for those students, which, as you say, you know, can be particularly challenging. Um, Fiona, do you want to talk about the outcome argument guidance and how it covers that? Yeah, um, we monitor it very closely and we are, we are as you say, very aware that um, that group is, has the, um, the lowest outcomes and that's consistent in, for both colleges and universities, so we're very concerned about it. Um, we have been working, as a first step, we've been working with um, ARC Scotland to see if we can um, work with them on some possible training. So they, they have put a funding proposal into us. It hasn't been considered by my senior management team, but I have all my fingers and toes crossed. Because um, I do believe that training is will be the, the most um, impactful thing that you can do to... Um, to, to try and help people with, uh, with, with mental health and try and help people to uh, disclose, seek the help that they need as and when um, they, they require it. In the college system, we actually have done a lot of work around there and we, we need to replicate that within the university system as well. And I'm, I'm hopeful in the, the college system we'll start to see a, a turnaround in the outcomes because we're certainly investing um, heavily in that, that area. And the last point is we are working with anybody within the Scottish Government who's working within this field. So we're part of the um, uh, framework for um, uh, uh, disabled young people and children. Um, we've become involved in the disability delivery plan. Um, so anywhere, and we want to connect up more with the Scottish Government's mental health strategy. And we've got um, real hopes that that will start to turn things around culturally and socially, um, as well as within colleges and universities. So we're trying to tie into to other work, um, and I'm really hopeful about this, this training as a first point to try and address the point you raise. I'm happy for that. Thank you. Would anybody else on the panel like to cover that? A general comment, I think. Um, I mean, obviously, disability covers a very wide range of conditions, and some are very obvious and visible. I mean... Uh, blind people, deaf people, people are f physically, uh, um, uh, their, their movements are restricted in some ways. These are very clear group uh, and uh, there's no difficulty about identifying them um, and beginning the process of meeting their needs. Um, uh, there are other areas, I think, um, we're much more conscious of dyslexia among students nowadays um, and deal with that much better. Um, mental health, um, I think, is a still a more difficult area because it covers a a spectrum of people who um, are really seriously mentally ill um, and that becomes an issue of how uh, universities work with the health service in dealing with that. Um, but then at a perhaps lower level, I think many universities suffer from stress and depression, um, uh, which can be a prelude, of course, to more serious mental conditions. Um, uh, not always. Um, and that, I think, is more difficult to identify. Um, uh, and there's a risk that that might be taken less seriously. But I certainly know from conversations with students, I think that's an emerging issue um, f among students, the, the, the levels of stress and, and, and depression among students. Hmm. Thank you. A topic we should pick up with the next panel as well mm -hmm. and hear from institutions themselves. I'd like to move on and bring in Mary Fee now.
But I think my, my question is... Oh, you, you, you've yeah, already yeah. asked your question, I understand. Yeah. David Torrance, then. Uh, thank you, convener, and good morning to the panel. Um, could I ask how the Scottish Federal Council and all the partners are supporting the Commissioner? So, supporting Peter? Yes. Um, well, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> we, well, in, I, I, when Peter was appointed, um, I, I met Peter and, and basically said, you tell us what help you need and, and we, will, we will try and ensure um, that we deliver it. Now, Peter is supported by some colleagues in the government as, you know, as well as you know, having access to support from us. And, and I think Peter will probably say this as well. There is, Peter has this dual role of both kind of joining things up and spreading good practice and being a critical friend but he also, but the critical bit, the critical friends, important as well. Peter needs to report annually on how the system in Scotland is doing, how how my organisation, how the government, how the universities and colleges are delivering access. So we need to be careful that we're not supporting Peter to the extent that he's not, you know, free to criticise us. So we we try to keep that correct balance between. Um, being here to help Peter in any way that um, you know, he asks for, but recognising that part of Peter's role is to say the funding council is either doing enough or not doing enough or is doing the right things or the wrong things, and similarly with government. So um, I think we, um, we've had an open door. I mean, anything that Peter you know, wants uh, Fiona and her team to work on, then you know, we've been open to that. And we've been seeing our work through our Access and Inclusion Committee and our annual a uh, Access Conference as something that aligns with Peter's work and Peter's been to these forums. So um, I think we'll, we'll be interested to see what Peter's view is. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, uh, I feel that, uh, that I have a very good relationship um, and good support from John and his colleagues. Um, as he says, though, um, uh, it may well be that in my annual report I will make recommendations which, um, although not necessarily directly critical of the Funding Council, might uh, push them in a direction that they don't particularly want to go just at this moment. Um, uh, I think I will also make recommendations to the government, and they may also uh, uh, feel the same, I'm not sure, um, and of course to institutions. Um, I think my role requires me to strike uh, a balance of uh, uh, pushing at the front chairs all the time, trying to push thinking forward, um, uh, trying occasionally for people to think outside the box, think that things are actually possible, which they previously thought were not possible, um, uh, while not being so unreasonable that my views are totally ignored um, by people. Um, I have to say um, that I've had a lot of experience as the head of an institution. Um, uh, I was a member of the board of the English Higher Education Funding Council. I chaired the equivalent of the Access and Inclusion Committee. Uh, so I think I have a good sense of the balance between um, uh, being rooted in what is possible and what is practical, um, but nevertheless being trying to be adventurous and in innovative at the same time. Um, but but uh, in a sense, you and others will judge. Um. Well, totally on a different subject, um, Brexit and the effect it will have on university applications, how do you think that will pan out? And especially with the, it could be a possible erosion of the quality laws that we've fought for. You mean the, the longer term effect yeah. of not having European law under... Um, well, that would be um, an, an issue that would be very much for governments um, both in Scotland and the UK to decide which bits in the long term, you know, once things are um, repatriated, you know, what, what happens to those? It's, it's not really an area that I'm that well qualified, um, you know, to, to speculate on, not least because um, th there's quite a lot of uncertainty about, you know, how these things will happen and when and what the impact would be. There are quite a lot of impacts of Brexit, um, potential impacts of Brexit on um, on the university system to do with um, research funding and you know, work is being done to, to try and reduce that uncertainty. And there is an impact um, given that you know, around about 10% of the, the entrants to Scottish universities are from the rest of the European Union, excluding the UK. Um, now, that number um, in the most recent UCAS figures um, has gone down a bit. And actually, in the context of access, it went down by almost the same number as the number of students from MD20 went up. 
So there are you know, a whole series of consequences there that weren't necessarily ever thought through as a, you know, um, something that um, was going to be a consequence of Brexit. But you know, there are, as we work through this and some of the uncertainties go, some of the issues that you've raised about, well, what are the equality um, laws that we're working within that they'll be very much a matter for the UK and Scottish governments. So, I mean, at the moment, we're um, continuing to work within the current laws, but we see, uh, you know, as Fiona su suggested, you know, equality and access is all very much part of you know, one philosophy rather than you know, um, something that's very granular. Yeah, thank you. It's just a very um, brief supplementary. Um, you raise a very interesting point about the, the loss of research funding um, f from the, the EU, because it, it would seem to me, and it, I may be taking quite a simplistic view, that if we lose the research funding, that has the potential to have quite a significant trickle-down effect on a number of different things, research development, applications, um, and, and even job opportunities for young people in Scotland. Is, is, is that a, a fair point? Yes, I mean the the the, 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 the implications of um, you know changes to the level of research funding, some of which comes from Europe, um, you know, could be you know, but the research that happens in our universities um, does help drive the economy. I mean through the innovation centres and so on. So if you if you're doing less of it, that's potentially a bad thing. But work is being done at the moment. Um, you know, through the Scottish and UK governments to look at how you know that can be protected, so that you know even if it's not coming from you, there are some schemes that um, the government could potentially you know pay a subscription to be part of. There could be other ways of replacing some of that research funding. There's quite a lot of uncertainties there, but we're very keen that the capacity of, of our, our universities to do research and have access to staff, some of whom are from Europe, to do that research, um, you know, continues. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. I could probably give a slightly less diplomatic answer than John, um, as I'm more independent. Um, I mean, obviously, Brexit will have a whole series of very negative consequences. I mean, uh, one thing which is very unclear is that uh, a lot of our laws uh, to do with many of the issues of, of, uh, that relate to the work of this committee um, are ultimately rooted in European law currently, um, although the plan apparently is to incorporate all those into UK law uh, uh, and things will continue at least for the moment. There is a risk that some of those um, uh, gains that have been made as a result of European uh, initiatives in the past 40 years uh, might be lost. Um, uh, and the greater risk I think is that this might be rather imperceptible. Uh, it might be in small details here and there. It might be quite difficult to pick up the larger picture. So that's a general uh, a threat I feel. Um, uh, as John says, in relation to research, of course, it would be open to the UK to continue to contribute, um, uh, as Switzerland does, uh, as Norway does. Uh, it would actually make very good economic sense because the UK institutions currently uh, get more out in terms of research funding than the UK puts in, substantially more so. Um, whether the other European Union countries would continue to agree that, I'm not sure. Um, but the major area, I think, um, is, of course, uh, the implications, um, uh, the climate of public opinion. Um, uh, if uh, the UK is seen as a more xenophobic country, less welcoming to people from other countries, um, uh, there will be a greater reluctance for other Europeans to come and make their careers here, um, never, never mind those who come as students here. Um, and then, of course, finally, there is the... Uh, uh, the issue that the Scottish Government will have to face, uh, that uh, currently uh, other UK European Union students, apart from those from the rest of the UK, are included in the cap of funded places. Uh, they will no longer be included in that. Uh, so the Government will have a series of decisions about what to do with those, act ex those funded places that had become free. Thank you for risking the wrath of the Daily Mail there, Sir Peter, and uh, your candour in that. I think you'll find synergy with many of the panel members, the, the committee members here. Um, it, as we move into our last sort of five minutes or so with you, I wonder if the panel could reflect on uh, an issue that we covered quite extensively in our inquiry, and that's the, the subject of contextualised admissions, that whereby grades are weighted against particular social challenges that individual students might have faced. Um, whether the 
those are being applied universally, uh, whether there's consistency in how contextualized the, the contextualized admission process works, and whether it can be improved. Perhaps, uh, John, if you could kick off on yeah, that. Yeah, um, SFC um, published a report on that, I think, earlier this week, um, which was um, a report that we'd commissioned um, some time ago um, from um, the University of Durham, and they were looking at how contextualised admissions are used in Scotland and what the scope is for improvement. In some ways, uh, you know, they were trying to answer the very question um, that you set there. Um, we published that report that, this week, and what that report says is there is scope for improvement, and that you know, it, it provides, I think, a very robust evidence base for why contextualised admissions are a, a way of ensuring that you get the students with the greatest talent um, into universities, where, where you have um, to make decisions about which students to, to take in um, and which students you can't take in, I think they sh it should be based on those with the, the greatest you know, talent and potential. Contextualised admissions is a way of doing that, um, and we would want um, universities to be using that to the fullest extent. Now, some are doing that, um, and I think there is a nervousness among many universities about how to apply that because you know it's a controversial area. If you've if you've got um, high demand for your courses and you're having to say yes or no, saying it purely on exam grades looks fair and transparent. It's nice and easy to understand. If you're saying that you're weighing those exam grades differently for different students, you know, to the student who might have the higher exam grades who's going to find it difficult to get in, that will look unfair um, and you will need to have a robust evidence base underpinning that to explain why you've taken that decision but I think you know, there is now an evidence base there that um, allows us to do that. Many institutions you would want to see that in their own context and how it applies in their own universities and so on but they Sometimes that evidence is hard to get because they don't have many students who they've admitted with the, the lower entry grades. So part of what our um, research um, that we've published this week does is, is give them that. So we will be, um, through the outcome agreement process and discussions with the universities, asking them to do more on contextualised admissions because we think, you know, if, if, particularly in the more selective institutions, that is a way of widening access and getting the best talent in. Universities of Scotland have also done um, a lot of really good work in this area on the back of the Commission on Widening Access um, report and are looking at um, more consistent measures that could be used right across um, the, the system and they're also considering a better language that could be used right across the system as well, appreciating that it's really difficult for individual parents and their children and families to um, understand contextualised admissions and what it might mean for them and what that means in individual um, institutions. So there is a real movement of... Um, travel that, that's happening that kind of started with the Commission on Widening Access hopefully is helped by the research that, that we have published and can be progressed through the outcome agreement system. So Peter, would you like to? Um, yes, I, I think I would support everything that's been said. I think contextualised is, 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 admissions are a, a key issue. Um, I think we should always remember that the responsibility of universities when they admit students is to try and assess their potential. They're not actually rewarding current levels of achievement because there are lots of reasons why people have different current levels of achievement. Um, I think three points about contextualised admissions. Uh, first, I think um, there should be uh, fairly common agreement about what standard indicators should be used. Um, I don't think every university should make up its own system weighing different things in different ways. I think that makes it extremely difficult for applicants to understand. Um, Secondly, I think it should be much clearer what use this contextual information is put to. There's a risk it becomes a bit of a black box. I mean, students know these, these factors have somehow been taken into account, but has it helped them? I mean, has it guaranteed them a place? Has it guaranteed them interview? Has it simply guaranteed them some consideration? Often they don't really know. And my final point is that, um, and it was an important issue raised in the uh, report of, from the University of Durham, which John just referred to, um, I think we need to look at uh, the issue of risk. Um, if we expect all students, um, regardless of their current levels of attainment and their current previous experience of secondary education, to uh, continue to progress and to get the same, exactly the same degree outcomes as 
a student who comes from a very privileged background who's had a really excellent secondary education and had really excellent grades, um, that's probably unrealistic. We have to assess what is a reasonable risk that institutions should take. I sometimes feel um, that uh, in Europe generally, certainly compared to the United States where I spent some time, um, we are obsessed by wastage. We regard any form of wastage as waste. Um, I think in the United States, they see it very much in terms of uh, the glass half full rather than the glass half empty. Um, uh, and that experience, although the student may not have completed their immediate goals, is something they can build on for the future. Um, uh, and I think we need to adopt much more of that approach here in, in the UK and in Scotland. Thank you. That brings us nicely to the end of our time. Um, I'd like to thank each of you for your time this morning and for your contributions. They've been very illuminating. As ever, if there's something you would like to have told us but forgot, or if there's something that develops over time, please do keep in touch with the uh, committee. Um, we'll be keeping this dialogue open. So thank you again for your contribution. I'd like to suspend proceedings for five minutes to allow to change a panel and a comfort break. Thank you.